There is power in the blood of Jesus. You know, you don't often hear people talk about the blood of Jesus anymore. And one of the reasons why I believe that people do not talk about the blood is because talking about the blood means that we have to acknowledge the cross and people don't want to deny themselves today. Hello, I'm David Diga Hernandez and you are watching Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. Adam took from a tree for himself and brought about death. Jesus gave himself upon a tree and brought about life. We see the power in the blood of Jesus as recipients of the covenant, as recipients of the New Testament promises that God has made to those who put their faith in his son Jesus. I want to talk to you today about the power of the blood of Jesus. Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship and then we're going to get into this lesson here is Stephen Moctezuma. And hallelujah, you have won the victory. And hallelujah, you have won it all for me. And hallelujah. It is my prayer that after you receive this message, that within your heart there is a newfound appreciation for the blood of Jesus. Now, before I talk to you about the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, I want to quickly talk to you about covenants. You see, God will make arrangements with His creation through covenants. Here are the seven major covenants of Scripture. They are the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the land covenant, or also known as the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. Now, not all of these were made with just the people of Israel. Some of these were made with, for all of humanity, such as the new covenant, which is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, and also with the Adamic covenant, which has to do with man's dominion, and the Noahic covenant, which has to do with all of creation. So I'm not going to go over each and every covenant, but the reason I want to bring up this concept, this idea of covenants, is because the blood of Jesus is what purchased our end of the deal with God, our end of the covenant with God. Specifically, I'm referring to the Mosaic Covenant, 
which is found in the book of Exodus. And perhaps sometime in the future, I will do an entire message on just the covenants. But for now, let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verse number 6, where the scripture says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God made a covenant with the people of Israel. He called them apart as a holy nation unto himself. And he did this through speaking through his vessel Moses at Mount Sinai. Now it was at Mount Sinai that Moses received the law. And it wasn't just the Ten Commandments that Moses received. In fact, there are over 600 commands in the Mosaic Covenant. They fall under the categories of the moral laws, which have to do with adultery, murder, and theft. The dietary laws, which have to do with clean and unclean foods, the preparation of that food, the storage of that food, and so forth. They have to do with the social laws, which are having to do with property laws and marriage and divorce and civic laws. The purity laws, which has to do with the health of the nation. The feasts, the instructions for the priests, the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, the assembly of the Ark of the Covenant, the preparation of the anointing oil, how the garments of the priests were to be made. There are a lot of instructions in what Moses recorded. There were a lot of instructions given to the people of Israel through Moses, through the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai. But one of the things I want to emphasize here, a category which I've not yet mentioned, was the category of sacrifices and offerings. Now, in the category of sacrifices and offerings, we find commands given from God to the children of Israel for the atonement of their sins. This is where God required animal sacrifice. This is where God required the blood of an animal, the blood of a creation. And these animals were specifically named and they were to be prepared in a certain way. And you can read about all of these specific instructions in the books of the Bible that have to do with the law. So especially Exodus and then in Leviticus. However, I want to move on now to talk to you about the covenant that applies to us all today. And this is the new covenant established through Christ. Now, in the Abrahamic covenant, God promises Abraham that his seed will be a blessing to all people of the earth. That's talking about Jesus. In the Adamic covenant, Adam and Eve, God promises that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That is also a reference to Jesus. In the Davidic covenant, where God promises that the throne of David will be established forever, God promises that it would come through his seed. And in fact, in Luke chapter 3, we find that Christ himself is the son of David, upon whom will rest the kingdom, and that kingdom will be established forever. So Christ is the fulfillment of many of the aspects of these covenants. Now, in the new covenant, we find revelation. We find that the Mosaic law or the prophets and all of the commands that were given to the people of Israel are not enough to save the soul. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3 verse 20, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Now, we've been given a new covenant that is for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. The Jews who at first rejected Christ, which was a part of God's plan, made way and gave reason for God to graft in the Gentile, which is you and I. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we find that it was, in fact, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. For the scripture says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. And you can read all about the grafting in of the Gentile into the covenant that God has established with man through the Jew, through the nation of Israel in Romans chapter 11, and in fact, all throughout the book of Romans. But I especially want to emphasize Romans chapter 11, which talks about this grafting in. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their 
purpose. Now, many people find this idea of the law not being completely dismissed confusing. I'll simplify it for you. Simply put, Jesus fulfilled our righteousness through his life, but he cleansed our sins through his death. In his life, he lived out the law of God to perfection. So the word of God that was spoken to the Jew first has not been nullified, has not been done away with. In fact, it is the vessel through which God brings about the Messiah. It is the vessel through which God ultimately brings the new covenant. So the law has fulfilled its purpose and Christ fulfilled the law. So nobody can fulfill the law unless they are in Christ, because Christ vicariously fulfilled the law for us. We take the credit for what Jesus has done by simply taking his offer of salvation. So we cannot fulfill or appease God. We cannot appease God unless we are in Christ, and we cannot be in Christ unless we are in faith. So what was it that the new covenant requires of us? Because Jesus came, he fulfilled our righteousness through the way he lived, and he appeased God. He cleansed our sins. He sacrificed himself for us. He took upon our punishment. Yes, I believe in the atonement. And yes, I believe that Christ had to die as a sacrifice to appease the justice and the wrath of God. Now, there are some who don't believe this way. That's fine. As long as you believe that Jesus is the only way, you and I can agree. But I won't be moved on this because I think the scripture is very clear. And so Christ had to give his life. Christ had to sacrifice himself to appease the holiness, the righteousness, the wrath of God, to absorb it. The scripture says that all wrath was poured out upon him. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 tell us what God requires of us now. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It's faith. It's always been faith. What kept the children of Israel out of the promised land is what today keeps people out of heaven. Unbelief. God has always required faith. It was always by faith. Those in the past were looking forward to what Christ had done on the cross. And we today look back at what Christ has accomplished on the cross. But ultimately, we look to the blood of Jesus, who paid that price, who fulfilled the covenant with God, who stepped into our place, fulfilled the righteousness, fulfilled the law of God, and then as a spotless lamb became a sacrifice for you and I. Again, I'll say, with his life, he fulfilled our righteousness, and with his death, he cleansed our sins. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 22 say, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. This price that Jesus paid, the shedding of the blood, was to fulfill the covenant. He took up your end of the deal. And that's why this is such good news. God is not looking for you to fulfill these 600 commands. God is not looking for you to fulfill any of the requirements of any of the other covenants, though there are requirements in the new covenant, which I believe uh, exceed even in some places the requirements of the Old Testament laws. 
not necessarily in that they're detailed and tedious, but that they get right to the heart of the issue. The Old Testament, it says that if you commit murder, you should be punished, you should be stoned. But in the New Testament, you're guilty of murder if you even commit it in your heart. It gets to the heart of the issue. God gets to the nature, the soul of man, the depths of your being. The new covenant deals with the soul. The new covenant deals with the heart. The new covenant addresses the sin nature and crucifies it along with Christ. There is power in the blood of Jesus. He paid a price for you and I. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9 say, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. In John chapter 1, verse 29, we're given a description of what happened when John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching the scripture says, The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is powerful. Jesus was the one who cleansed us by his blood. Were it not for the shedding of the blood of Jesus, you and I could not be made right with God. You and I could not have peace. It is only through the blood of Jesus that we find peace with God. Now, Jesus, the scripture says very clearly, paid a price. Look at the way this version of the Bible puts this verse. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man and his form did not resemble a human being. He was beaten so badly that he didn't even look human. Every drop of blood was poured out from Jesus, served a purpose. You know, we know the value of a thing by the price that one is willing to pay to acquire it. In Christ's sacrifice, we truly see the value that God places on us. Jesus died. Jesus shed His precious blood. His precious blood. We're talking about pure. The pure blood of Jesus. He is the Son of God. Sin came through a man. Sin came through Adam. Sin came through a seed. Sin is transferred through seed. When Christ was born, when Christ was conceived, it was by the Holy Ghost. His DNA was divine. His body itself was divine. His blood was divine. This precious, spotless lamb, innocent, never sinned. Looked around the glory of heaven. He saw the throne of God, he, the Father. He saw the angels worshiping. And he looked down to earth, and he saw you. And he exchanged the glories of heaven and embraced the cross because he loves you. There is power in the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is power in the blood of Jesus to snatch us from death. There is power in the blood of Jesus to transform us into the image 
that God created us to be. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 28. I want to read these to you, but I want you to really let these words speak to you. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has answered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Think about that, once for all time. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think about how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our souls. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. Now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle, and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of the things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Did you hear that? I, that? That is one of my favorite portions of scripture. That is the salvation message laid out and it traces it all the way from the early covenants till now. He purchased this covenant with his blood. Now why? Why would he do this? It's because there is power in his blood and he purchased benefits for you and I. Number one, the blood brings protection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the scripture says, Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Now you can read about this in Exodus chapter 12. The angel of death passed over Egypt, taking the life of every firstborn. What God instructed the children of Israel to do was to take a goat or a lamb and to sacrifice that lamb and to take a hyssop branch and to sprinkle the blood and to 
Smear it over the doorposts and on the side posts. The entryway was covered in blood. And when the angel of death came to each home that had the blood upon it, it would pass over that house. That's why Christ is called our Passover lamb. He protects us. Now, let me make something clear. It is not guaranteed to any believer that we'll never have to give our lives for the gospel. The giving of your life for the gospel is something that you have to be ready for. It's very possible that you may have to give your life for Christ. God never promises that we won't have to give our own blood for the gospel. And every true believer recognizes this and accepts this as a fact. I remember I was with a pastor in a green room before we were about to tape a television program. And he showed me his book and he said, take a look at this book. And I saw the title of this book. It said, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, sounds like a typical uh, sermon that you would hear today, but the cover of the book was a painting of Stephen the martyr being stoned to death. Now, think about that one. So I'm not saying that God will never require our blood, that God will never require our lives, but I, in fact, He does require our lives. I'm simply saying that the protection He offers us is that we will always be in His will and we will never die before our time, our appointed time. As long as we walk in that covenant, we walk in that obedience. Remember, the children of Israel had to stay within their houses. They could not go out. They had to obey. You're walking in obedience. You're walking in obedience toward God. You are a recipient of that covenant. So now, the Scripture also tells us that the blood brings authority and deliverance. The scripture says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony, him being Satan. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die or other versions of the scripture put it as they loved not their lives unto death. The power of the blood breaks addiction, breaks demonic bondages. It breaks old habits. It breaks curses. It breaks chains. The power of the blood of Jesus gives you authority. The power of the blood of Jesus gives you deliverance. We overcome the enemy through the power of the blood and the word of our testimony. We overcome the enemy by applying the blood to our lives, by holding to that covenant, which, by the way, again, is received by faith. All of these benefits are received by faith. You say, how do I apply the blood? How do I receive it? It's simply by faith. Everything that God wants to give to you is received by faith. Everything that God wants you to become, you become by faith. You receive from this covenant, you receive the benefits of the new covenant, all by faith, purchased by Christ. So you receive these benefits, you receive divine protection, you receive authority and deliverance through faith. Third, the blood brings healing. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Psalm 103, verses 2 through 3 say, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Healing and salvation are one and the same. And they're one and the same because they come from the same covenant. Finally, the blood of Jesus brings peace of mind. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. John chapter 19 verse 2 says, and this is powerful, John chapter 19 verse 2, The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Now they were mocking the Lord. And I said, Lord, why did they have to put the crown of thorns on his head? And the Lord spoke to me, he said, it was with the crown of thorns that Jesus was crowned the Prince of Peace. He bled on his brow. He bled on his head, which represents the mind to bring about peace. Romans 5.1 and Hebrews 9.14 tell us that the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice, brings about peace with God. In fact, the blood of Jesus cleanses even the conscience, even the memory of sin is cleansed, and that brings peace of mind. When you have peace with God, you have peace in everything. Now, Jesus bled through 
sweating drops of blood at the Garden of Gethsemane. These are the seven places he bled. Jesus bled on his face when they beat his face with rods and they ripped his beard out. Jesus bled on his back when he was scourged. Jesus bled on his head when they placed the crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus bled on his hands when they nailed his hands. Jesus bled on his feet when they put nails in his feet. And Jesus bled from his side when they stuck the spear in his side. Every drop that Jesus shed served a purpose. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Let's claim that power now for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I feel the anointing. I pray for that one who is receiving this message now. And I ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that the power of the blood would break every stronghold in their life. I break addiction now in Jesus' name. I break the power of sinful habits right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke fear and anxiety and I pray the peace of God. The Lord is leading me to pray for healing. Come on, get in on this covenant now. It's yours to claim. Jesus already paid it. All you have to do is stand in faith. Only believe all things are possible. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one now who is believing for healing in the body. There's something wrong with severe migraine headaches. Somebody's being healed with severe migraine headaches. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, for everything you're doing. Lord, let the healing river flow now. There are healing waves just flowing right now. He's touching your life. This is the presence of Jesus. It's the healing presence of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. And Father, help us never to take for granted the power of the blood. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your mercy. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to say, if you believe it, say, Amen. Well, that is it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. And if you'd like information on how you can join the Spirit family, then go ahead and click on the link that's just about to appear over my head. If you're not watching this on YouTube, that link will not appear. Instead, use the information at the bottom of the screen to find out how you can become a member. Now remember, members receive these weekly emails, these teachings. They receive them on Sunday, and on Monday we release the video to everyone else, so you get to see the lessons first. Now, depending upon which time zone you live in, that time frame I just laid out may not correlate exactly, but still you get it before everyone else does. Now, I want to get to the comments here, and these are comments from the Holy Spirit and Prayer, which was the teaching I did last week. Miss Simply Imperfect writes, Thank you so much, David, for allowing God to use you to teach us more about the Holy Spirit. Your videos are very encouraging, and they bless me so much. And you're writing from the Philippine Islands. Thank you for watching. I love the Philippines. I got to come back one day. Philip Brown writes, Thank you for this, Pastor David. I realize that I have not been praying the way I was supposed to, but now I know I love Jesus, and I thank Him for all He has done for me in my life. I thank and praise him forever, and may Jesus bless you more and more. And you're writing from Louisiana. Well, God bless you, and I pray the Lord bless you more and more also. Naomi writes, Thank you so much for making me understand the Lord's Prayer. Now I understand the Spirit has to be with us when we are in prayer. I will always be grateful for your teachings. Thank you so much, Pastor David. You are a blessing, and I think you are a blessing too, and I think every one of you who watch, I feel like even though we haven't all met personally, one day we will, I feel like we're all one big family here on the YouTube channel, not just Spirit Church and just those who watch the teachings, but those who are all subscribed, those who receive through emails or television. I'm always grateful for just this community that God is bringing together, and we're going to accomplish big things together, I promise you. Birthday wishes, one of our regular commenters writes, There's so much about the Holy Spirit that I wasn't aware of. Thank you for this teaching. And finally, Michael Robles writes, Hi, Brother David. I am so amazed on how the Holy Spirit has revealed my prayer and spiritual condition. I believe God is continually transforming me. I desire that moment by moment. 
I am aware of my friend, the Holy Spirit. God bless your ministry. And God bless you, Michael Robles. We thank you for watching Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. Now, don't turn off the video. I want to talk to you for just about a minute. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, that the generous shall prosper, and he who refreshes others shall himself be refreshed. We want to win souls. Listen, we're doing big things, and I want you to be a part of it. We are going to take this world for Jesus. I'm telling you, we're going to see millions and millions of people come to the cross of Christ, but it takes support. It takes help. We want to get to the next phase of ministry, which includes our new building, which as I've listed these things many times, the monthly support that we need is almost in. Here's where we are on our campaign. And again, after that campaign, we're going to keep going and keep growing. So that doesn't mean we're going to stop taking offerings after the campaign's over. It just means that we can now take that other step. Once that campaign is done, we can take the next step into the next phase of ministry, hit that next plateau. So that new campaign, that, that expansion, what that's going to do, it's going to get us a facility. And in that facility, we're going to be able to do weekly meetings. We'll be able to do more live broadcasts from the studio. We'll be able to produce more content because we're going to have more people working in-house. We're going to be able to bring on more ministry staff. We're going to open a 24-7 prayer center. We're also, and here's what I'm really excited about, we're also going to be doing more events in more locations. So if you're saying, I want Brother David to come here or come there, become a partner and help us get these events going. We want to start doing more of these events all over the world. We're also launching a brand new TV network. Encounter TV is going to go from being a program to a TV network, and we're going to have all these um, great programs such as Spirit Church, Steve Moctezuma's Worship. We're adding now interviews to our channel. So there is a lot coming your way. Ultimately, all of it is to do these two things, win the lost and build the believer. And ultimately, that's going to win souls. So sign up today to become a $30 a month partner. Help us by taking the gospel all around the world. Maybe you can't do $30 a month, but you can do $5 a month. You can do $10 a month, $15, $20. Whatever you can do, do it now. Whether it's a one-time gift or a monthly partnership, sign up today. Don't say some other time in the future, this or that. People say, Lord, bless me and I'll give. But the Lord says, give and I'll bless you. So I challenge you. I'm challenging you to step out in faith for the sake of the gospel. Not for the sake of self, not for receiving. Just help us take the gospel all around the world. You see what we're doing. Go on our website. Check it out. Take a look at all the events, all the media, everything that this ministry is doing. It's good soil. We are doing a lot, and we're building the kingdom, and we are winning souls. Help me do it today. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you so much for watching Encounter TV. My name is Steven Moctezuma, and I want to encourage each and every one of you to subscribe to Encounter TV. Encounter TV features hundreds of videos that will help you draw closer to the Lord. We feature worship, miracles, teachings, and so much more. Encounter TV, experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit.